is part of sort of my ongoing uh, research project on essentially uh, violence, order, and the state. And I think I'm going to leave the, the war part of this out. And I have spoken a little bit about different aspects of this already here. But what I want to do today is take one or two uh, further steps and escape the, the sort of fixation, especially in international relations on security studies, on what we would call the present, uh, focusing on short-term and policy-relevant problems that uh, are associated with contemporary conflicts and armed violence and back away from that and of course that's dangerous for an international relations person there's probably some historians in the room um, but I'm going to give it a shot um, and try and talk a little bit about uh, uh, well what I what I'm troubled by which is the, the so-called declinist thesis which is best summarized by the work of Steven Pinker and others uh, that suggests that not only has war ended but large-scale violence is going down and this is happening in a long-term secular way and uh, that we shouldn't really worry about this. As Pinker recently published with Andy Mack in Slate magazine, we've never lived in such peaceful times. And in the aggregate that might be truthful, but I think that the aggregate conceals a lot of interesting things that are going on that I want to talk about today. And I think that some of them, which we can summarize very quickly, would include the diffusion of the means of violence and the instruments of violence, the weakening of state institutions in large parts of the world, so-called privatization of security, and the rise of networks of violent actors operating across state and regional borders. Now one obvious result of this is that violence takes place most often within rather than between states, sometimes as civil war, but also most often as large-scale intercommunal violence, organized criminal and gang violence, insurgent or other uh, armed group violence in places such as northern Nigeria, Mexico, Colombia, South Sudan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, parts of Southeast Asia, Central America, and uh, elsewhere. So I want to look at the way in which some of these different articulations of contemporary violence reflect the struggles within and between states to establish institutions that can evacuate violence and force from everyday life. So it's not the conventional international relations cut on this issue, and I'm deliberately avoiding the language of, of war and armed conflict here. In general terms, I have some really, really big uh, puzzles here. Uh, um, and I think they're absurdly large, uh, if you will, uh, questions. And I do not pretend that I'm going to give a comprehensive answer to how we end up with, with Pacific states that don't prey on their populations, that don't fight very many wars, but more importantly have created domestic order and provide security as a public good, and I'm going to talk a, a lot about that uh, today. In short, how do we get the Barian states um, that possess the legal and legitimate monopoly on the use of force? Now these questions are connected with one debate in international relations, which we could summarize as the large variations on Charles Tilley's arguments about war making and state making as organized crime, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. One debate in contemporary policy circles, which is the so-called fragile states debate, and the promotion of good governance, and this is today exemplified in the debates in New York and elsewhere around the successors to the Millennium Development Goals, so-called Sustainable Development Goal number 16, which is going to commit states to promoting uh, achieve, uh, the achievement of peaceful and inclusive societies, one indicator for which is going to be uh, insecurity and lethal violence. And there's one programmatic debate that this touches on too, which is large-scale efforts around the world to reform and restructure security sectors, especially in post-conflict states. There are wholesale attempts to reconstruct and reorient the armed forces, the police, the gendarmerie, and the criminal justice systems uh, around the world in places such as Kosovo, Mozambique, Burundi, Guatemala, Haiti, uh, Iraq, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, and elsewhere, <coughs> usually uh, in post-conflict contexts. Now, almost all of these reflections, whether it's programmatic, policy, or academic have been conducted with almost no or little or no reference to the kind of scope conditions under which the Weberian ideal type states that we have here were created and what kind of variations do we have on the forms and manifestations of insecurity and violence. So I'm going to unpack this uh, and again not quite answer these absurdly large questions uh, and I'm going to do this in three steps. The first is a very quick sketch of what I think we should uh, consider the functions and modes of security provision in the Weberian state, a potted history of how these may have emerged and some of the key uh, 
we're going to call them processes and mechanisms that we should be looking for, and then some paradigmatic contemporary examples. Um, I could call them case studies. They're somewhere between anecdotes and case studies, so maybe I should think of them as examples. And you'll see when you get to the end of it, this is actually sort of an agenda, maybe even outline of a book, if you will. So it will be blown up in various uh, directions. Okay, broadly speaking, we can say that the uh, contemporary state performs three kinds of functions, which I'm just going to loosely call welfare, security, and representation. I will not obviously talk about welfare uh, and security. The welfare function is, is linked to the ability of the state to provide a stable political legal framework in which capital can be accumulated and invested, property rights can be guaranteed, uh, there can be a shadow of the future, and economic activity as we know it can be conducted. The representational function uh, is argues that state legitimacy is somehow connected to its ability to embody the interests and, and aspirations of a community, whether this is through such ideas as national self-determination or the democracy, rule of law, human rights promotion literature that focuses on that. Now, I should just say, the other two core functions of the state uh, that people focus on have huge scholarly literature that examines the conditions under which things, under which such things as economic development uh, or democracy uh, and re representative rule emerge. There's modernization theory, there's various variants on development theory, there's arguments about democracy promotion, blocked democratization, etc. But with respect to the third thing, the security function, which is the one I want to focus on, we're wandering more or less in a scholarly desert, I think that's a slight caricature, um, but there's very little comparative or comparative historical work that examines the conditions under which Pacific states emerge. And so that's one of my justifications for the project, is to start uh, some reflections on the sort of comparative uh, uh, literature on this. Now, how can we understand the security functions of the Bavarian state? Well, there are four things that it does, um, and these can be very quickly summarized. It eliminates rivals who contest monopolies, it suppresses violent contestation that undermines monopoly, it tames the Leviathan by reducing abuses uh, of power and state repression, and it provides, at least in theory, security uh, as a public good. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining all of these, but simply to point out that the very first of them is the one that's received the most attention, at least in international relations, which is the famous sort of Tilly-esque dynamic of war making uh, and state making. And for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it can be summarized with a very simple slide. There are many variations of this, but this is Tilly's uh, simple diagram of war making, extraction, protection, and state making. I want to say that there are actually two things going on here in his argument and those that scholars have tested it. One of them, which is where most attention has been focused, is the war making, extraction, and state making dynamic, which is how states acquire resources through increasing and progressive forms of taxation, the creation of public debt, uh, and so on, and how that extraction is used to fight wars, make states, eliminate uh, smaller rivals, and consolidate uh, territorial power in uh, principally Western Europe, but then elsewhere. There is also a second dynamic, though, which receives a lot less attention, which is essentially the extraction, protection, and state-making side of the triangle. And here, I think there's uh, probably more work to be done on how it is that uh, state elites uh, extract resources and promise in return protection and what kind of forms that protection takes and who is protected by that. So to go back to this slide here, I would argue that at least the second function of the state, um, which is this notion of maintaining order, uh, is the one in which state elites uh, essentially bargain, and this would be Tilly's language, make a bargain between uh, principally economic, but not necessarily only economic uh, elites in their territories, extract resources and promise some form of protection, in particular private property uh, and security of capital. Um, so this is the kind of protection against large-scale violence that they will perform. This is not providing security as a public good. This is providing security as a club good, which you could say is, is excludable but non-rival in consumption, to use that language. That it's, it's provided uh, uniformly to a particular group, those who are members, those who pay their dues, if you will, uh, to the state. And so this function uh, of the state is probably something that needs to be focused on a little bit more because it's one of the principal deals that is struck, I think, in contemporary uh, state-making around the world. Now, the third aspect of this, 
I'm very hesitant to say anything about mass violence with Jonathan here having just written a book on this, but the third element focuses on this conditions under which the power of the state or the abusive power of the state can be controlled because of course it is a coercive, uh, predatory and violent instrument that is used as the history of mass killing and genocide uh, demonstrates um, that is used widely around the world. Of course we also ought to include not just genocide and mass killing, but what you would call all aspects of state coercion and control, torture and physical harm, state repression, secret policing, and the so-called uh, state, which occurs in, in the Middle East. Now I think it is not uh, necessarily regime type per se alone that explains this, and some scholars such as Christian Davenport have argued that there is a kind of a democratic domestic peace thesis that is as robust as the democratic peace thesis. But uh, we should pick at a little bit more clearly what are the processes at work uh, that maybe constrain uh, state violence and what is it uh, that we would be looking for in particular dynamics. And I'm going to do that in a minute here. Um, the last thing is providing security as a public good. Uh, I should say this happy state uh, where the state provides security to all of its citizens is a relatively recent uh, development both in the history of sort of policing as an institution but also the provision of public order uh, and it involves a whole number of processes which include the evacuation of the armed forces from uh, acting domestically and providing order, the separation of policing from military functions, the demilitarization of domestic police forces, and finally such things as oversight, community policing, and so forth. Now if I had all evening, uh, I could present a long historical account of how these different things emerge. And I'm not going to take all evening because none of us have that. So I'm going to provide a, a quick potted history that focuses principally on what I'm going to call mechanisms and outcomes. I'm going to run through four slides that, that provide uh, what I think are the principal mechanisms and outcomes for each of these modes. Um, the risk of this kind of generalization is great, of course, and I'm going to be simplifying it enormously. Um, but I think I can make good, uh, if not in the question period, at least in subsequent book chapters, on this kind of argument. The first one here, which is the, the eliminating rivals uh, function. This, again, is... Uh, fairly straightforward and has been dealt with extensively in the war making and state making literature. Here I would only make three points, which is that the mobilization of the state for war fighting uh, took place along a kind of a, a ratchet function, not a linear function, where uh, it was facilitated by improvements in the fiscal capacity of the state, including the invention of sovereign debt and greater levels of taxation, and that this reached progressively larger levels that you never came down from. It's a long story, but you could summarize it by saying that the average size of the army tripled between 1500 and 1600, tripled again between 1600 and 1700, uh, and by the time of Napoleon, uh, France had an army of 600,000 as opposed to uh, the army of about 60,000 that it had in around 1700. This is a paradigmatic case that's used to illustrate a phenomenon that we can see in many other states in, in Europe. Not surprisingly, these states were principally war machines. 70 to 90 percent of state expenditures went on war making. So there wasn't much left to devote to what we could think of as the other modes of security provision. But in addition to the war fighting, the dominant perhaps security concern, equal to at least war making, was the concern with co-opting and subordinating local rivals to the monopoly. And I think that this second mode is probably more interesting and there's less been told uh, about this story because there are different kinds of bargains that can be created between state makers and their local elites and sort of economic uh, and other political elites um, in order to consolidate central power. You could say, of course, one of them is simply conquest and elimination of rivals. This is the sort of French absolutist model, but there are at least two or three other modes uh, that we can see here, or two or three other processes. In Prussia, which is relatively weak uh, and agrarian, the balance of power between the center and the periphery was much weaker, and one result was that although Prussia had a more absolutist system, the concentration of power at the center was paralleled by key privileges being left uh, with the landed nobility, with the Junkers, and one result, quote, was that it undermined the central government's monopoly on the legitimate use of force, and this is more or less uh, throughout the 17 and early uh, 1800s. So 
one bargain here that is struck, and it has to do with the different economic endowments and political structure of Prussia, is much less centralized than this sort of Tilly-esque model would lead us to believe. Um, in England, there is a form of co-optation that occurs, uh, and this is a, also a long story, but one way of uh, co-opting elites is, of course, through the armed forces themselves, in, in this case the sale of commissions and the recruitment of uh, the officer class from uh, essentially the nobility and the aristocracy, uh, which ensured that the armed forces was populated by people who had a vested interest in the status quo and were less likely to challenge central power uh, through things such as coups or other kinds of military revolts. So you have a co-optation uh, form as opposed to a decentralization. And thirdly, you also have one where the center does not hold. Paradigmatic case here is Poland, where in the 1760s the National Army had 16,000 men under arms, where the Polish nobles had about 30,000, and neighboring states had two to 500,000. And under these circumstances, extinction was, of course, the uh, only logical uh, outcome because it could not impose central state could not impose central uh, rule. I'm not going to say anything about the third uh, function here, which is the way in which armies were pushed towards having a purely outward uh, orientation and an external focus on uh, defending the nation against external threats, but this is because this is part of the story of the other uh, modes that I want to focus on. Mode two was suppressing violent contestation, especially which threatened elite interests and involved the provision of security as a public, uh, as, as a club good for elites. Now this had a couple of different periods. Up until the end of the 18th century, it involved responding to episodic and large-scale eruptions of violence, usually through the deployment of what armed forces you had. And as Tilly himself points out, up until the great 18th century consolidation of Western states, mercenaries, bandits, private armies, town militias and armed rebels repeatedly brought large-scale collective violence home throughout Western Europe. This was captured, I think, reasonably well by Eric Hobsbawm's uh, and the whole literature that he has spawned on bandits, <laughs> which are not bandits that we think of in the narrow sense, but actually large-scale uh, predatory groups. Prior to Napoleon, most European states had little capacity to deal with these sorts of rebels. Uh, and, and uh, bandits. In England in the 1700s, public order was provided by local militias, constables, and only in extremists by the army. In France, there was a centralized policing structure in place by the 17th century, but in 1714 there were about a thousand men patrolling the whole of rural France, which was clearly inadequate to deal with these kinds of threats. Similar stories can be told in Austro-Hungary, Spain, and elsewhere. So that first phase was very decentralized order was quite local and, and actually mostly absent. Uh, in the second phase, uh, which changes, which is marked by the Napoleonic uh, innovation essentially of the gendarme, uh, which was emulated very quickly uh, across most of Europe, even in the post-Napoleonic somewhat reactionary territories, the gendarme was a hybrid force that was created uh, as quasi-military terms, uh, mainly professional at a time when armies themselves were becoming conscript. Most of its officers were former soldiers. It was under the command of the Ministry of War and operated on a military style structure. And it was not uh, providing public security, but order maintenance uh, for the state itself. There was also a spatial dimension to this. Uh, as again Weber uh, points out, um, the gendarmes were engaged in the surveillance of subjects in the countryside and policing who was engaged in protecting citizens in the cities. So there was a distinction between subjects and citizens that was at play here. And throughout the 19th century, these kind of paramilitary forces were created or reformed along French lines in Spain, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and basically everywhere except here, which had a very different tradition. And that tradition has influenced the way people think about policing in some, I think, negative uh, or limited ways. The third dimension was this question of state violence itself and taming uh, the Leviathan. Here, in the early modern period, the state ruled indirectly and its ability to coerce and control the population was relatively limited, partly because it relied upon privileged uh, intermediaries, nobles, priests, oligarchs, uh, 
and other office holders involved in such things as tax farming and so on, who were only loosely controlled uh, by uh, the Crown and carried out their sort of business at the, the local level. And the potential for using force against the population in a large scale is limited when the state itself is vulnerable to localized resistance from these powerful intermediaries who perform this uh, intermediate and controlling function with respect to the use of violence. Now, I'm not going to claim that mass violence was completely absent under indirect rule, uh, but it was arguably somewhat less prevalent than in subsequent periods. I should say this notion of indirect rule, just to foreshadow the argument a bit, was used in a couple of other periods. One is the colonial period to describe British, uh, in particular British forms of rule in its colonies, um, and another is today in post-colonial states to describe the way in which some of the states operate with respect to traditional, uh, still uh, residual political structures. And so you may have the same kind of effects in some of these cases. At least that's what I want to look for. But again, this transforms itself uh, over the intervening period, and in particular around the French Revolution. It's going to turn out to be a story of the French Revolution, which could be a bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm going to get in trouble here pretty soon with people in the audience who know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but Revolutionary France, of course, represents a sort of paradigmatic case, again, uh, for the new model of uh, direct <coughs> rule, and it realizes the potential for violence that's inherent in enhanced state capacity. There are probably about 40,000 deaths in the Reign of Terror, and upwards of 100 to 150,000 in the war in the Vendée. So these are not small-scale <laughs> riots and uh, violence, but rather starting to assume the kind of proportions that we would think of as uh, large-scale in contemporary terms. So, at least in some way, the scope and scale of state violence is linked to different modes of rule and different kinds of potentials for mobilization of populations and resources. Now, of course, the 20th century story is one which the, the state reaches its kind of climactic power, and most of the major episodes uh, of state violence occur here. The list is, is fairly depressing, and you're all familiar with it, um, but once we move below sort of large-scale uh, genocidal mass killings, we still end up uh, with what Barbara Harf uh, and Ted Gurr have called politicide, now, which is large-scale killing that may not be genocidal in nature, uh, may not be mass, may unfold over long periods of time. But they document 48 cases of genocide and politicide uh, between 1945 and, and the, uh, the mid-1990s. And others estimate, and this is a very rough estimate, between 60 and 150 million people have perished in episodes of mass killing uh, in the 20th century. Um, that's a very wide variation and it partly depends on the definition. There's not much dispute about how many people died. <laughs> There's only dispute about the categories we put them in. It's quite hard, after thinking about this record of the 20th century, to come up with an argument that says, as Steven Pinker does in The Better Angels of Our Nature, that somehow there's a linear progression to a more peaceful order. And the only way he achieves this sleight of hand, which is a footnote uh, to my presentation, uh, is by presenting it solely in um, per population terms, because at the same time you have a dramatic increase in global population, which results in lower levels of death per 100,000. Um, there's something a little bit dubious about this, and one of the things that's dubious about it is that many of these people survive because of uh, better health care and longer life expectancy, and we know that most people who commit violence are young men between ages of roughly 18 to 29. <laughs> and so as you have an aging population structure, you will expect less violent exchanges among individuals who are older. Um, I think half the people who've reached age 60 are alive today, <laughs> uh, ever, that is. Um, and so there is some kind of, uh, again, sleight of hand that occurs in these kind of linear uh, accounts of how violence uh, decreases. Um, in any case, to come, to close the parenthesis and come back to the, the argument about state violence, even if we go away and down below mass killing uh, to things such as extrajudicial killings. The best documented evidence we have here says that almost 60 states have perpetrated uh, extrajudicial killings, that's more than 50 per year, um, in at least one year since 2000. This is a significant number of uh, states around the world that are still engaged in uh, periodic and episodic extrajudicial killing. And it often takes the form of summary executions, um, so-called social cleansing in Latin America, uh, police uh, violence in places such as Nigeria and Kenya uh, and elsewhere. Well, the happy part of the story is the idea that states provide security as a public good. 
Again, this is seldom realized in practice and more often discussed in theory. And the mechanisms that lead to this are much more contemporary in process. Um, arguably, public security up until the middle or late 19th century is relatively weakly provided and highly localized. The English model is one in which you organize tithings and shires and you end up with shire reeves, which give you the word sheriff. Um, and it's community based in a sort of uh, pre-modern form. But the concept of police uh, and its modern form only really emerges uh, in the mid 19th century. And here we can date it in Britain to the creation uh, uh, under Robert Peel hence Bobby's, uh, of a, a national police force based in Scotland Yard, it turns out, um, which resulted in the expansion of domestic policing. By 1855, there are about 15,000 police uh, in England and Wales. And the events of 1848 and the social unrest that we uh, uh, see throughout Europe and the Industrial Revolution transformations were critical drivers for what gives rise to modern police forces throughout most uh, of Western Europe, very quickly exported in one form or another to the urban areas in the colonies, which is something that I haven't talked about, but there's an entire history of policing which Ian Loder and the colleagues in the criminology department are, are working on, which talks about the way in which uh, domestic uh, forms were, were exported and how well or not well uh, they were adapted to uh, providing police functions in uh, the colonies. I think I need to work on the issue of policing a little bit uh, more, but there are at least two mechanisms and transformations that we can see. One is the 19th century, one that I've referred to, which is the creation of mostly urban-based uh, police uh, that are essentially modern institutions demilitarized in nature and separate from the command structure of the war department, if you will, starting to come under Ministry of Interior and maybe even subsequently under uh, civilian control. And the second is something that we call community policing, which is a widespread model that I will refer to at the end that really only emerges in roughly the 1970s and 1980s in the United States and in Europe, uh, and then is generalized uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, into different parts uh, of the world. Um, it takes different names, I think, in, in Latin America. It's, it's citizen security and democratic policing and things like that. But it's the same kind of concept, which is very localized uh, and accountable provision of security as a public good. Reading the newspapers about the recent events in American cities and the assaults on African Americans, uh, it's pretty easy to see that community policing also is practiced in theory uh, more often than in practice, and security is clearly not a public good provided widely to all. <coughs> okay, that was a really potted history, and I apologize for that. The point was to highlight what the possible dynamics here are, and I'm following Tilly and uh, Taro and McAdams' idea that we should look for particular mechanisms that we might be able to use to understand uh, developments in different environments. Now I'm going to turn to uh, the contemporary period for the next uh, couple of minutes here and simply sketch uh, what I'm going to call the insecurity trap. In international relations we have Paul Collier here and others who speak about the conflict trap, which is states that are caught in endemic cycles of large-scale violent conflict. Development economists talk about poverty traps and capability traps to describe also these kind of pathological forms. And I think that we can say that large parts of the world are stuck in insecurity traps in which none of the mechanisms <laughs> that I've highlighted here are operating in a positive way. <laughs> and in fact, some of them are operating in reverse uh, to generate persistent long-term and large-scale uh, insecurity. And we could summarize the four characteristics of this by just mapping them on to my different modes of security provision, if you will. Large-scale contestation, inability of the state to eliminate major challengers, persistent state repression, and corrupt, ineffective, uh, absent or predatory uh, policing. You don't have to have all four of these present to be caught in a severe, severe insecurity trap, but I think we can start to sketch out where and why some of these uh, things uh, may exist. Now, the first cut that I have on this is a table, which you almost certainly can't see all the names on. Um, maybe even you can't. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna describe very quickly what's in this here. I've taken my four modes of security provision uh, and I've used uh, different data sets, it's a bit of a mashup at this point, um, to try and highlight which states might on a prima facie basis fall into these kind of categories. Um, 
the, the main sources are as follows. Uh, as Calypso mentioned, I run a project that generates publications called The Global Burden of Armed Violence. The next one is coming out May 11th. Um, I was hoping to have a physical copy to wave today, but it did not arrive yet. Uh, send okay, I'll send you the link, absolutely. Um, and there I've taken the 30 most violent states around the world, uh, all of which have uh, rates of lethal violence greater than 10 per 100,000, uh, which is below the global average. So these are the 30 most violent states, many of which uh, score high on public insecurity and uh, large-scale uh, disorder. I, I could give you the data behind all those, but I, I won't bore you. The second uh, source is the Uppsala conflict data, um, both armed conflicts, which involve the state, uh, and one-sided uh, violence, uh, and as well uh, state violence that results in more than 100 uh, deaths per year. Um, and then the third is a slightly more dubious source. Well, it's not dubious in its sourcing, but it's dubious in its comparative ability, which is the political terror scale, which is, uses Amnesty International and State Department reports and scales countries on their level of political uh, violence, if you will, uh, with categories four and five being the highest levels of sort of generalized uh, state repression. Um, and that might account for the fact that there's a longer list than I think I need in, in the third category, and I want to look very carefully at that. Um, but of course, many states appear in more than one category, and that's not accidental <laughs> because there are dynamic processes at work here where conflict and high levels of insecurity uh, may often breed uh, state violence uh, and back and forth. But I do think that it would be worth highlighting what exactly the, the levels and scope and scale of violence are in some of these places to indicate what kind of generalized different forms of insecurity uh, may exist. And you could think of this as my universe of cases, if you will, from which I'm going to then choose uh, subsequently some that I want to work on in more detail. So what would it look like if I were to focus on exemplary cases. And here I think I can close, this is my uh, second last slide, that gives you some ideas about how we might want to try and talk about <laughs> the different kinds of modes of security provision in these uh, uh, highly insecure zones and what we would be looking for in all these. I'm not going to go through the 12 examples that I've listed here. What I've done is chosen them both because they are very high in the levels of violence and insecurity uh, in each of these states, and they are clearly cross-regional, <laughs> that in each of the categories it's quite easy to find examples uh, that are not confined to, to one continent or one geographic uh, area. And this, I think, is, is obviously important. Now, whether or not there are sufficient similarities in the dynamics at work uh, between, let's say, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, and Afghanistan or South Sudan, this is an empirical question. <laughs> it depends on the level of generality in which I want to pitch my argument. But I think, by and large, uh, one can find that in every one of these cases, the dynamics that would lead to the positive uh, evacuation, I should use the normative language, the positive evacuation of violence, uh, large-scale violence from the public sphere, are either blocked or going in reverse uh, in uh, all <coughs> cases. I think I'm going to save any discussion of the examples for the questions because I'm quite happy for people to, to talk about that and, and as both Jonathan and Monica know, I've kind of sketched in uh, little bits of history for at least one country for each of these. Uh, what I want to do in the last minute here uh, is simply <coughs> bring this together and explain uh, or answer one obvious objection to what I've done here. Um, one objection would be that I've done a sort of mashup of not just different forms of violence but also different forms of data uh, and that I'm trying to tackle holistically a problem that is actually many different problems and I'm prepared to talk about that a little bit uh, in the uh, in the question and answer. But I think that there's an increasing amount of scholarship that is starting to see the way in which different kinds of violence are actually linked. And one of the critical weaknesses of the international relations literature, especially on conflict, is that it tends to start once the violence has erupted. So it asks, you know, what are the dynamics of war now that we know there is a war in country X? Um, and you can pick any on the Uppsala data list. Whereas, in fact, that leaves out all of the antecedent conditions and the forms of violence that are principally associated with state repression uh, or intergroup tensions that maybe violence as violation do not necessarily result in death 
of high levels, um, but that are the important antecedent conditions uh, for these large-scale eruptions uh, of violence. So that would be the first thing, is that, that we start in the wrong place in international relations. We need to start much earlier. The second, and this is a quote from a recent article by uh, Douglas Lemke, Lemke and, and David Cunningham, which is that the similarity in the kinds of causes that they see for different mechanisms uh, that are occurring that lead to regime change, in their case, um, suggests that maybe the causes of civil wars might also be, quote, the causes of riots, demonstrations, purges, and wars among disparate non-governmental societal groups. They pose this as a question, and I take this actually as probably a starting point, and maybe even already a conclusion. Uh, we should be surprised if the causes were radically different, because these are all forms of violent contestation. So, the first defense of the mashup is that the phenomena in the real world are actually tangled together and that we need to start at a more analytically appropriate place. The second uh, point is that in the policy and programming world, there has been an attempt to treat the security sector as a whole, to take on board uh, wholesale social engineering of armed forces, police, criminal justice systems, gendarmes, etc., in especially post-conflict uh, cases And so we need to ask ourselves, if you're going to approach this ho holistically, are we actually understanding the different modes and functions uh, that these institutions perform and do we have a clear sense uh, of how they might fit together? And the final point is that these kind of things, these kind of programmatic choices and these kind of theoretical arguments do have very practical consequences. And the norm is to start with an anecdote, but I'm going to end with an anecdote here um, to give you a sense of what's at stake here in, in the real world. Uh, in 2003 to 2006, in post-Saddam Hussein Iraq, the United States did many things, but one of the things they did was try and create a national police force. And they trained 67,000 officers, or policemen, usually men, sometimes women, um, in Jordan. And they used the model of community-based policing that they had just finished using in Kosovo, because they'd been so successful there. <laughs> um, and they brought these police uh, officers back into uh, Iraq. They were lightly equipped, badly trained, and poorly armed, and they were clearly inappropriate to the tasks uh, that they faced and the kind of violence and insecurity. Now, that in itself would mean that security was not being provided for the Iraqi citizens, but they became a specific target of the insurgent groups. 4,000 of these recruits were killed by insurgents. Entire police units collapsed. 8,000 of them, in addition, were injured. <laughs> this is a mortality rate among a national force that would exceed that of virtually any army that goes into combat, by the way. That's quite a high level of mortality. Um, and this is an extreme lesson in what happens when you get it wrong, uh, when you fail to understand what kind of institutions and institutional responses you need for the kinds of insecurity uh, that are uh, exist in any given environment. Iraq is an extreme case, but it is not the only one. <laughs> Um, and I'm prepared to go into some of the examples uh, here throughout the discussion. I, I've clearly backed away from talking about Mexico because Monica's here and I wouldn't want to say anything about Mexico uh, that would get me in trouble. But there are other people who are probably experts on every one of these countries um, and I'm happy to take any insights you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Pete.